Welcome to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. Join us Sunday mornings at 9 at 2939 County Highway CX next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage. You can also visit us online at gbcportage.com. Today we continue the Foundational Framework Sermon Series with Pastor Jeremy Edmondson. We're in Matthew chapter 12. We're going through a series called Foundational Framework, and the reason why we're slowing down at this point is because this is a pivotal turning moment in all of history, not just the Bible, but all of history. The reason is, is because we spent time looking at major events that were leading up to the time of Jesus so that we would be able to understand Jesus. And what we find is, is that if you don't understand who God is, and if you don't understand who we are, And if you don't understand what sin is, there is no way you can understand the God-man that takes away the sins of the world. This is so important. So in doing so, we have followed the promises of the Messiah and what God was seeking to communicate to the world about the fact that he alone offers deliverance. And yet out of all the ways he could possibly give deliverance, he gave it through a frail Jewish man. So what we're finding at this moment is that by the miracles that he worked, by the teachings that he gave, the signs that were granted to him by the power of the Holy Spirit, all were the stamp that signified him as the Messiah. But the religious know-it-alls of the day decided, no, his power actually comes from the devil. That's where he gets his juice from. It's not from God from Satan. And in doing so, with all of the knowledge that they had, with all of the revelation that they had been given, with how much God was screaming in their faces with what they were seeing, they denied him. In doing so, they committed what is called the unpardonable sin. And if you want more information about that, that was last week. So now Jesus has condemned them. And what I want us to do is I want us to look Let's probably start here at uh, start at 30, verse 30, chapter 12, verse 30. He is in a hot and heavy, uh, reading them the riot act kind of thing going on here. Jesus is fired up. I love it when Jesus gets fired up. It completely destroys all the hallmark moments that we have of him. It's kind of good every once in a while. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. Is there a fence? Can you sit on the fence with Jesus? Oh, in fact, you sit on the fence too long, it begins to hurt. So you don't want to do that. Jesus won't let you. Everyone at some point in their life has got to make a decision about what they believe about Jesus Christ. He either is God in the flesh, the Savior, Deliverer, payer of sins, or he is the craziest person that recorded history has ever documented. It's one or the other. You can't get your way around it. Even Jesus is clear about it. You're either with me or you're against me. So he moves on. Verse 31, therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people. Now stop. Aren't you thankful for that? You ever blaspheme Jesus in your life? See nobody. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Which means, yes, I have. So notice, he says it'll be forgiven people. That's good. But as far as what the Pharisees have seen from the demonstration of the miracles, from the power of the Holy Spirit, notice what he says here. But blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. He reiterates it again, 32. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, and remember, these are men who had witnessed the acts of the Holy Spirit being performed through the Messiah as clear as day. A man with a withered hand, stretch out your hand, it's made whole. A man who was demon-possessed, exercise. Now notice that no head spun around, nobody projectile anything, right? Exorcist, get that out of your mind. It's not what the Bible says, okay? Then people be crazy. So, whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age 
Okay? If that wasn't bad enough, but notice what it says. Or in the age to come. There is no salvation for these men because of the conclusion that they were promoting, whether in their life or the life after. When the kingdom comes and the next age is ushered in, they cannot be saved. Unsavable. That's exactly how terrible this sin was. I don't know if you've pondered that. Spend time thinking about that at some point. This is like we see in Revelation with people who take the mark of the beast. When they take the mark of the beast, they have just made the decision to become unsavable in the eyes of God. They cannot be redeemed at that moment. It's a scary thought. So as I was trudging through, I thought, man, verses 33 through 50, we can get that done this week. And the Lord said, no. I said, why, God? And he goes, because the context is not going to let you do that. And I said, why, God? I need to get through this. Do you realize this is foundational framework number 50? You guys have set through 50 Sundays of this. Perseverance, endurance, right? Like, yeah, I get that. I get that. I sit through the preacher's sermons. I get it. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's kind of you. I will pay you later. Verse 33. Here's the reason why I can't go any further than 37. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For, and real quick, for is what's known as a causal conjunction. It is linking together the reasoning or an elaboration of the statement that was just made. It's giving you the cause for it, okay? The tree is known by its fruit. Now you say, what is so profound by this or, or, or with this? Anybody got a fruit tree out in their yard? Anybody got a fruit tree on their property? Do you pull fruit from it? Is it good fruit or bad fruit? It's good. Now here's the thing, and I don't know about tree stuff. What's a tree guy called? An arborist. I should know that. Spending time with Kevin. I should know that. Is he here? Oh, where's he at? Oh, he's in the back. Oh, you didn't hear that, did you? Oh, okay. Oh. It doesn't take a genius. It doesn't take an arborist to know that if you've got good fruit, you got a good tree. Anybody ever seen a funky Charlie Brown Christmas tree with the most amazing red apples you've ever seen in your life on it? Have you ever seen that? No, because it doesn't exist. Or let me say it this way. The product has got to be consistent with the contents. Follow me now, because notice what he says. For, here's the reason, the tree is known by its fruit. Put your finger here. Turn back to Matthew 7. We're going to do a lot of flipping around today because of the subject at hand. I'm going to show you this in just a second. This is towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus is teaching his disciples about what it is to live a life that is worthy of inheriting the kingdom. It is not a salvation by works. Salvation, being justified before God, is by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. However, after you are justified before God, it matters how you live. It is not you were just given a one-ticket way to heaven, and now, you know, don't worry about sinning anymore whatsoever. It's all under the rug. No, your sin still matters. You're still going to heaven, but your sin still matters. Jesus wants to teach his disciples how to live a life that is a worthy life, that it's a life worth living, not because it matters now, but because it will matter in the kingdom to come. And so he says here, chapter 7, look at verse 16. Actually, let's do 15. That'll help us. Beware of the false prophets. Okay, everybody got that? Prophets who are bad. You can just write that in, right? That's the Jeremy translation. Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. They look like you. They smell like you. 
They dress like you. But notice what it says, but inwardly or what? They will tear you up. See, this is why when you judge somebody, whether or not they're saved on their works, doesn't make any sense. The most deceitful people look just like me. Even Satan masquerades as an angel of light, does he not? So this whole thing about judging on appearances, let's get that out of our minds. That's not our place. But notice verse 16. You will know them by their what? Everybody see the similar language? Watch it. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? Are they? No, they're not. In fact, it might not be a bad idea to click your rare, antique, one-of-a-kind Grace Bible Church pen and write, No! in there. Which, by the way, this is a brand new Grace Bible Church pen. Let everybody know. Mm, the suspense builds. Back to Scripture. Okay. <laughs> Verse 17. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. Did we not just read that in 1233? So notice, you can write that there. Does everybody see how it's consistent? The larger context is going to help us understand what Jesus is talking about here. We're only, you know, five chapters away. But watch what he says here. And stop. What are the subject again? What's the subject? Who are we talking about? You will know who? False prophets. False prophets. Mark it in 15. That's who he's talking about. That's the subject heading. Verse 18. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, before you say that's hell, it's not. It could be, but it's not. It could be the fact that they are judged or disciplined in a temporal manner, or that all of their works are burned up at the judgment seat of Christ. We will all give an account for how we lived in the body, the things we have done, whether good or evil, 2 Corinthians 5.10. That is a judgment for believers, not unbelievers. The unbeliever judgment is the great white throne judgment. Okay? It's important for us to know the difference. That's in your notes. If you want to know more about that, send me an email. We'll talk about it. You buy me coffee. Verse 20. So then, you will know them by their what? Now, here's a question. If we're talking about false prophets, and we're talking about the fact that they look like anybody else, uh, let, let's just put it in our modern day vernacular. This isn't what he, he means here because the church isn't in existence yet. But he looks like church folk is the idea. He looks like regular Mary and Joe that you go to church with. What do you think he means by fruit? You will know them by their fruit. You might know. You might want to take a stab at it. What's that? Can't be their good works. They look just like all of us. They're what? No, not their gifts. Their speech. Oh, I actually got to congratulate you today. Good gravy. Let's turn back to 12 and let's see. Let, let Jesus, it, it hurts me real bad, Tom. Uh, Tom. Yeah. Let's spend time first John 1, 9 again. Um, go back to this. Let's let the context fill in the blanks for us. So look at 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad, and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. Now, I love it. Verse 34, you brood of vipers. How to make friends and influence people, right? How could you, being evil, here it is, church, speak? What is what? There it is. The fruit is somebody's words. The fruit is what you say. It is what proceeds out of your mouth. And it's also what you type on Facebook, right? Well, I'm not speaking. That's pharisaical. Because notice that Jesus is going to tell you the real problem here. You brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? For, here's your causal conjunction, the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The fingers type out that which fills the heart. What you say shows me you. And what I say shows you me. If you want to know who I really am, get me talking. There you go. 
I'm like, you won't shut up. We know enough about you. I get it. But people can hide it for a while. They can modify behavior for a time. But eventually the truth comes out. And the truth doesn't come out in actions as much as it does in words. Who you really are is filled up here and will show itself here. Notice what Jesus is saying. He's speaking to the Pharisees. He was earlier talking about how to identify false prophets. You identify them from their words. How can you, Pharisees, being evil, speak anything good? How can anybody trust your spiritual guidance when the insides of you are unregenerate? You're lost. How in the world could you give sound advice about what God thinks or how you should choose in a situation? Notice what he says here moving on. Keep this in your mind, but it comes out of the heart. Verse 35, the good man brings out of his good treasure what is good or good things is the idea. Notice it says after that, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. Everybody see the word treasure there? It just so happens in my translation how it's set up. Treasure and treasure, they're, they're one over the top of the other as the lines go on. I was able to box them both because right there he's talking about the heart. The treasure chest. Your treasure is your heart. Think of it that way and read it. Notice what it says. The good man brings out of his good heart what is good. That's the product that comes from the content. Everybody see that? But notice the next part here. The evil man brings out of his evil heart what is evil or evil things. Now watch this. And if you're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, this will ring a bell with you. Verse 36. But I tell you, Jesus is going to set down a divine authoritative assessment right here. Look what he says. I tell you that every careless word that people speak they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. Everybody see that word? Careless. Careless word. Idle word. Useless word. Anybody got something different there in their translation they want to share? Anybody got anything? Somebody said something. What's up? Empty words. Fruitless language. Having no substance, it's contentless. The contentlessness of our words reveals the contentlessness of our hearts. Does that make sense? What you say, what you are communicating is the product of who you are in your being. What fills your heart? Every word we speak, we're going to have to answer for. Have you kept track of everything you've said? I haven't. Mainly because after I said it, I didn't want to. It wasn't anything worth keeping track of. And I stand here with the word of God staring me in the face saying, I'm going to ask you about that later. You and I were going to talk about that. You ever had that conversation with your dad? What did you just say? And we go into freak out mode. Calm, but freaking out. We usually do this. Because we got to have something nervous and we're trying not to cry, right? What kills me is that the Savior is going to love and lovingly question us about this. I mean, he's not surprised we sinned, right? That didn't catch him by surprise. He's not caught off guard. But was it characteristic of a redeemed, blood-bought saint of God who is sin-free in the Creator's eyes and was given new life to be lived out through them because we do not have the ability nor the capacity to live that new life out ourselves. 
Was it prompted by the Holy Spirit? Was it prompted by us? Let's take a trip. We'll come back to that question. If you would, take your Bibles. Turn with me to 2 Peter. If you got somebody next to you that's not familiar with their Bible, there's no shame in that. It's a big book. We don't expect everybody to have down where 66 books are located in this. But if you got somebody next to you that's having trouble finding it, help them out. You already know it's after 1 Peter, right? I love it. If you've ever read through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, there's a lot that is said about somebody's words. Words are effective. Words can calm, words can soothe, words can stab. A lot of times we slit our own throats with our own tongues. And we do so willingly and joyfully. There's something to be said about examining the power of words. Look at 2 Peter 3. This is talking about people that scoff and mock the second coming of Christ what it will be like in the end times when people want to ridicule you for holding fast to a Savior that they cannot see and who promised to return as we just testified in taking of the Lord's table. But yet, where is he? That is the mocking. That is the scoffing that they bring. Notice chapter 3, verse 5. Peter tells us, For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice. Now watch this. And if you want to mark it, do so. That by the word of God. The heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. What formed it? The Word. The Word. God spoke, and what was not became. He used words to create. That should tell us something from the get-go of Genesis 1, just how powerful words are. But notice, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water, talking about the flood in Noah's time. Verse 7, but by his what? Word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. God not only creates by words, but he also destroys by words. He will judge by words. Let me show you another one. Turn to the left to Deuteronomy. Or as Tom affectionately calls it, dude, you're on to me. It's all right. My favorite prophet is the Spanish prophet Malachi, so we're good. Hannah and Rory just had their baby boy. They named him Malachi. I asked him if they were going to name him Malachi. Fruitless, empty words again. Chapter 13 of Deuteronomy. Sorry, did I not tell you the chapter? Too busy talking. See? Fruitless, empty words. Chapter 13 of Deuteronomy. Look at verse 1. If a prophet... Or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder. And the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, now watch this, concerning which he spoke to you, saying, here it is, let us go after other gods whom you have not known and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now watch this. You shall follow Yahweh your Elohim and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments. Here it is. Listen to his what? His voice, his words. Serve him and cling to him. How do you tell a false prophet? See, what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 7 isn't any different than what Moses was communicating in Deuteronomy 13. It doesn't matter if they make things appear, disappear, heal the sick, raise the dead. It does not matter. What are they saying? That is the power. Why? Because from that is revealed the heart. How about turning back to Deuteronomy 4? 
And all these are in your notes. Don't feel like you have to write them all down. But I want to show you the power of words in the scriptures. Deuteronomy 4, look at verse 10. This is Moses talking to the nation of Israel. He's going to die at the end of this book. He is leaving them with final instructions, and he recalls their memory back to the day when they stood at Mount Sinai and they heard God's voice. Exodus 20 is where that is if you want to write it in. But notice Deuteronomy 4 verse 10. Remember the day you stood before Yahweh your Elohim at Horeb when Yahweh said to me, assemble the people to me that I may let them hear my words. This is Participation Sunday. So jump in or get tanked up on coffee. I don't care, but everybody put your hand in the bucket and we're all going for it, okay? Let them hear my words. Why? So they may, number one, notice that hearing his words, hearing Yahweh speak from atop of the mountain serves two purposes. Number one, here's what it is. So that they may what? They may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth. In other words, when you hear God's words, it is not just for you to gain knowledge. It is to change your direction. It is to reassociate your life. It is to obliterate you and rebuild you into the image of Christ. Because I promise you this, everything that you're seeing on TV, everything you're reading in the newspaper, everything you have on an internet feed, regardless of what it is, it is a lie. It is a lie. You may not believe that. It is. How do I know that? Because only God's word is true. If God's truth is the only truth, everything else pales in comparison to it. Only it is true. Therefore, everything you and I receive has to be measured by it. God gave his word. Why? So that we would learn what it is to fear. To fear him. Because if he's telling us the truth... There's a lot to say that affects how you and I make daily choices. Thank you for listening to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at P.O. Box 534, Portage, Wisconsin, 53901, or email us at gracebibleportage at gmail.com. If you've missed any episodes of Walking in Grace, you can listen on our website at gbcportage.com. Scroll down to the Walking in Grace link. Also, you can join us Sunday mornings at 9 at Grace Bible Church, located at 2939 County Highway CX, next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage, Wisconsin. Or you can join the live stream on YouTube or our website at gbcportage.com. Thanks again for listening to Walking in Grace.